So that does bring us to our topic of the harvest. Um, this is the resurrection in which we will be included uh, as the church. Uh, so again, we're looking at 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but this time we're going to go all the way to, to verse 24. So it says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. So by a man came death, that's referring back to Adam, that through one man death entered. So by one man all will be saved. Uh, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming, then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule, all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Uh, so this verse again, uh, wedged within this timeline, is what we're looking at in Revelation. So where it says when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power, that's what chapters 4 through 18 of Revelation are focused on. He is abolishing all the rule, the authority, and the power of Satan, uh, who is the present ruler of this world. But after that, he will still have one enemy left to conquer, and that's death. And when we look at the chaff and the eternal state towards the end, we'll see that final conquering of death. Uh, but this word order is an interesting word here. It's used often in a military sense, uh, like a brigade or troops. Um, so we do have the idea here of uh, different groups that will be resurrected at different times. So order is the Greek word tagma, uh, which means ordinance or a command, but also fixed assessments or payments. And these, I think, are where we get our... Uh, our understanding is body of soldiers, a division, a brigade, an order, or a rank. Um, generally, arrangement or a footprints. Uh, so I, I'd say definition number four is probably going to be the closest uh, to what is meant by Togma here. Uh, body of soldiers, division, or brigade, probably division would be a good one in the English to bring that into. Uh, because it's not really setting one group above another, it's just putting them in their proper order. Uh, you can even think of it as the uh, progression of a stage play, where certain people come out at certain times um, to play their part. Uh, and that, that's really what's going on. That's why we'll see the church resurrected before the Old Testament saints, because they have something to be doing during those seven years and that what they have to be doing is in heaven. Whereas the Old Testament saints, uh, they have something to be doing in the kingdom. So they'll be resurrected after the seven-year tribulation. Um, so again, we'll get into that as we go through here. Uh, but first, we kind of have to establish where these different groups come from, why there are divisions, and uh, where the divisions are drawn. And this all has to do with a concept called stewardship. Uh, throughout the ages of the earth, God has different given different stewardships to different groups of people. These aren't salvation concepts. Often they're confused with different means of salvation. These have nothing to do with salvation. They're rules for living, uh, rules which govern those who are already saved. Uh, so for instance, we as the church, we have the stewardship of grace. Uh, we have a responsibility to edify the saints. We often use the term iron sharpening iron. Uh, that's actually a scriptural mandate for us as Christians. We're to be edifying one another. We also have the uh, Great Commission, which is to go out into all the world and to preach the gospel. This is another mandate which has been given to the church and uh, is our responsibility under the stewardship of the church. And the third one that the church has been given is to glorify God. And that's what we do in this earth. And we often don't do a great job of it. Uh, perhaps it's even our biggest failing as a church is to render the proper glory to God for all that uh, all that he is worthy of. And part of that glory that we render to him is to understand his plans for the future. 
28% uh, of scripture is prophetic at the time it was given. About 11% of that prophecy is left unfulfilled to this day. And uh, just as surely as the first 17% was fulfilled, we can anticipate the fulfillment of the next 11%. Uh, and in doing so, uh, we give God glory. Uh, so that, that's what we're doing in this Revelation study, is we are bringing glory to God through the understanding of who he is as he's revealed himself to us. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a lot of different ideas of how many stewardships there are. Um, in other words, how many rankings or divisions there are. This is uh, the debate of what's called dispensationalism. Um, it's a common topic. Perhaps you've heard of the Schofield Reference Bible or even John Nelson Darby, although he didn't uh, get much into this. Uh, but it, it's a topic worth discussing. I think the most common view is that there are seven different stewardships in world history, uh, often called dispensations. There's really only textual evidence for three. Uh, we can understand theologically some others, but we, we can only really hold on to these three. And these three are pretty much understood by almost all, um, all different theological spectrums, be it covenant theology, dispensational theology. Um, I recently heard what's called remnant theology. Most of them do see some sort of um, change in stewardship. And they see that because they are biblical words. Um, so we have to account for them. So here in Colossians 1, 25 to 27, it's talking of a new stewardship. Uh, having a new stewardship implies an old, so this uh, is an implicit and an explicit uh, use of this word stewardship. So it says, of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God that is the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, so this is Paul as the steward of this current age. Uh, he has a responsibility to preach the gospel to us, to edify us, and to glorify God. Um, and he passes that responsibility on to us as the church. Uh, so that is seeing a new stewardship as the church. And we call this the administration of grace or the stewardship of grace, um, the age of grace. You'll hear all these terms tossed around, but it, it really designates a separate uh, portion of people. Uh, Lewis Ferry Chafer, the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, um, use the word intercalation, which has the idea of a parenthesis in time. And that's how he defines the time of the church, where it's not a sub-plan of God, it's not plan B, it was a plan of his from ages past, um, but it's one that was hidden from previous uh, knowledge in the Old Testament, but uh, is the current age which would with, in which we're in, and once this age is over, he will pick back up with his uh, plan before the church. This church is really the harvest where Christ says, I came to Jerusalem and there was no harvest to be found, so I went out and I uh, gave the gospel. This is the harvest that Christ planted um, at his first coming. He is coming to reap again. So the administration of grace in Ephesians 3, 1 through 3, Paul says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. So not only do we know that this is a new stewardship, but it is defined by grace. And that does not mean that grace was not existent before, but it means that uh, grace is such a huge part of what this is uh, that we can use a totality transfer and say that um, it is all of grace. We also have a very explicit uh, indication that there is an administration yet to come. And this comes just a little earlier in the book of Ephesians, uh, where Paul says, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him 
with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Uh, this is speaking of the administration yet to come, uh, which we uh, have titled the kingdom. Some call it the millennial age. Some call it the dispensation of the fullness of time. That was probably its earliest name because of this verse. Uh, we don't like to give theological titles. We like to give uh, titles directly from scripture where we get the understanding of that concept from. Uh, so what we looked at here are two stewardships spoken of specifically, the church and then the fullness of time. So those are going to be distinct periods of time, periods in which uh, the rule of life may change, but the foundation of salvation always remains the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, in the new administration of the church, implying an old administration, well, that's what we have as basically the entire Old Testament is that old administration. Uh, some say that it's from Moses to Christ. I think there's good evidence of that. Others would bring it all the way back from Abraham to Christ. Also good evidence for that. This is why a lot of people will see multiple stewardships um, previously. The stewardship of Abraham, they would call promise. The stewardship of Moses, they would call the law. And it's really important to understand that none of these have to do with salvation. The law was not given to Israel to save them, but to convict them of their sins. It's given to them as a law to show them that they can't live up to it. Uh, just like if we fail to preach the gospel, if we fail to bring glory to God, if we fail to act appropriately within the church and edify the saints, we're not going to lose our salvation. Those, those aren't salvation um, issues. Uh, those are things that we are expected to be doing once we've received salvation from Christ. Um, so the same goes for Israel. Those who have been justified through faith were expected to be followers of the law as well. Uh, but the law was not given to them for them to be successful in it. It was given for Christ to be successful in. Um, and he did that in, in Romans 3, I believe it says that Christ is the end of the law through fulfillment. Um, he's fulfilled the law. So the, the age prior, um, we can lump that into Old Testament, um, but there are as many as four different distinctions, I think, that some will make in the Old Testament. For our purposes, the old administration, the current administration, and the future administration will all have different destinies here that we're looking at. So we can see this kind of here in a graphic. You see that everything is surrounded or surrounding the cross, that the cross is the foundation of how we uh, receive justification so that we might be resurrected. But these are the different groups that are seen um, as administrator or as uh, stewards of God's, uh, of God's rule of life. So we have currently the church, but prior to the cross, we had promise, uh, which can go all the way from the, uh, or pre-promise from Adam all the way up to Abraham. So that would be the first 11 chapters of Genesis. We have the patriarchs um, and Israel, which would be from Abraham up to the cross. Uh, they're anticipating the Messiah, the seed, the king. Um, as progressive revelation increases, they have a better understanding of who exactly it is that they're waiting for. Um, but down here at the bottom, we've got a pretty interesting one. We've got the tribulation saints. Uh, this is a group of people that will enter into salvation after the church has already been taken up. They will not enter into the body of the church, but rather uh, they will be joining the resurrection of the Old Testament saints as God has finished with his intercalation of the church. He's wrapped up that special plan of his, the bride of Christ, and uh, saints during the tribulation enter into salvation through faith in Christ, uh, but they enter into the same or a uh, contemporaneous resurrection with the Old Testament saints. Um, so now that I've given you all the definitions and the big idea, we're going to look at some verses that back that up. Uh, so here's 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 3. Uh, I wonder, Kelly, could I have you read this for us? I'll read 
Sorry, I'm speaking as uh, <laughs> on mute. Okay. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. <clears throat> While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. Thank you. So what's interesting in this verse is that Paul tells this church at Thessalonica, which was a very young church at this point, that he has no need to write to them about times and epochs. They already have a solid understanding of this. This was an early truth that Paul taught them uh, what to expect. So he says, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Well, if this was information that Paul found important to teach to a very young church, less than a year or two old, uh, we should also be focusing on this because this is our living hope. Uh, so what? how does he continue here? Uh, Kelly, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 12. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another, just as you also are doing. Thank you. So in 1 Thessalonians 5, he's talking about this time of testing that's coming on the earth. He's talking about how, uh, how destructive it will be, how total and complete it will be. So it's a lot like the book of Revelation, just in a tiny little bite-sized form. But at the end of this pericope, he says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. Well, after seeing the destruction that's coming on the earth, it's kind of hard to say encourage one another uh, unless we are somehow escaping that uh, calamity. So he says, for God has not destined us for wrath. We're not destined to go through the wrath of uh, revelation. And uh, our, our destiny comes from our salvation with Christ. I've often heard it say that uh, Christ isn't in the business of beating up his bride before he marries her. Uh, the wrath of the lamb that's coming in during revelation is not the wrath of man. It's not the wrath of Satan. It's the wrath of Christ. It's the bringing of justice and punishment to the earth. Uh, his bride has been justified in him by his blood to escape this wrath. Uh, you're not punished for a crime for which you're acquitted. Uh, and we get this understanding also in John 14, 1 through 3, where he tells his disciples he is preparing a special place for us. Uh, Mark, could I have you read this? Do not you let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Thank you. So this, this was a promise that Christ gave to his disciples when he said that he would be leaving. Um, but he, he, he said that he is going to prepare many dwelling places now, this word dwelling places sometimes is translated mansions. I think the NAS, NASB has done a better job of tra translating it here and saying dwelling places. But that Greek word mone uh, really means temporary dwelling places, similar to tents even. Uh, tents is not the quality of what we'll be living in, but it is the temporality of what we'll be living in. Uh, this dwelling place, uh, yes, it is our anticipated future, uh, but we will have something to be doing at the end of those seven years, and we'll look at that later. But uh, the, the idea here is that God's building a place for us to inhabit in heaven during the time that there will be tribulation on earth. Uh, we, we escape that tribulation, and um, often well, this is called pre-tribulationalism, and it's often accused of being escapist. Uh, that, oh, you think you're going to escape tribulation? Well, we don't think we will escape tribulation small t, because that's one of the only promises given to the church, is that we will face tribulation. Uh, but we will escape the wrath of Jesus Christ on this earth, uh, because we are not destined for wrath. Um, so whether or not that's escapist or not, uh, it is the teaching of scripture. Okay, but uh, Yeah. So 
I mean, I agree with everything you said there at the end, because he does tell us that we'll have to go through, you know, some persecution and some tribulation. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, you know, the end times, though, the tribulation, mm -hmm. uh, where God has not destined us to wrath. I yeah. mean, what you just said after reading that was that, that the wrath doesn't necessarily mean saving us from, although I know you are a pre-trib guy. Mm -hmm. That statement right there in verse nine is saying from death, eternal death. So if he allowed Christians to be persecuted up to the point of death in the past, then why would we not also potentially have to go through some of the tribulation? Some well, the crux of the argument really hangs on who is the wrath coming from. Uh, right now, this is Satan's world. We are not spared from Satan's wrath. We're not spared from the wrath of mankind, uh, but we are spared from the wrath of Christ. And you're saying that the tribulation is the wrath of Christ. Yes. And we'll look at that in Revelation, because that, that really is the topic of chapters 4 through 18, is Christ's specific wrath upon the earth. Um, and chapters 4 and 5 are going to be the justification for that wrath. Why um, he is just in bringing that wrath on the earth. Uh, he will use different uh, elements of this world to bring that wrath, uh, but it is the wrath of the Lamb, and the Lamb is none other but Christ himself. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. All right, so uh, this word rapture, probably one of the most contentious words um, in all of Christendom. Um, it's, I, I mean, one of the easiest uh, rebuttals to uh, one of their arguments against the rapture is, you probably heard the argument, rapture is not in scripture. Uh, well, it's true that the English word rapture is not in scripture, but the Latin word rapture is in scripture, and it comes from the Greek word harpazo. This Greek word harpazo means to be caught up, taken by force, carried off, snatched away, taken away by force, uh, snatch, snatches, snatching. Uh, to be seized. So this word harpazo is used multiple times in scripture, especially in the, uh, in the epistles, and it's not without precedent in scripture either. If you look at uh, Genesis 5, you'll see Enoch was taken up into heaven. He walked with God until he was no more on this earth. Uh, God did take him off of this earth without tasting death. Uh, Elijah as well in 2 Samuel was taken away rather than facing death. So it's not an uncommon concept in scripture um, for those who walk with God to be caught up into heaven, to be with God um, and not have to taste death. Um, so that is uh, the living Christians at the time of Christ's return, that is their destiny is to be raptured up with Christ. Uh, another reason that uh, I'm pre-trib, another argument that I would have for that is, what's the point of rapturing the church at the end? Um, you'd rapture them. We, we call it the yo-yo rapture. You take them up into the sky just so you can come back with them, because in uh, chapter 19, we see the bride of Christ returning behind him. So if they're returning, they obviously must not have been on the earth at that time. Uh, all right, so since we're doing controversies here, John Nelson Darby, I don't know who's heard of John Nelson Darby, but um, you either love him or you hate him. Uh, I, uh, I haven't read much of Darby, uh, but I do have an appreciation for him, and I'd like to justify that. Uh, one of the uh, reasons that people reject the rapture is the concept of newness, um, that it's a new, uh, a new understanding uh, of scripture. Well, first, there's plenty of evidence that even the first century church anticipated um, the Lord's quick return. They anticipated escaping wrath. Uh, they also anticipated a millennial kingdom to come after that. Uh, there's an early church father named Pseudo Ephraim, who even uh, specifically states that it is after the tribulation, uh, and it will be for the length of a thousand years where Christ will rule bodily on earth as the king over Jerusalem. Um, so this isn't a new concept. 
um, but it is one that was lost uh, during the Dark Ages uh, from about the third or fourth century under Constantine and the, uh, the time of the Catholic Church until the Reformation. Because what really happened during the time of the Catholic Church was that we lost uh, a literal hermeneutic where there were, there were two competing seminaries, essentially, uh, in the third century. The, uh, the college at Antioch and the college at Alexandria. Well, Antioch was using a literal hermeneutic. They were interpreting scripture literally. And Alexandria was interpreting scripture allegorically. Well, when, um, when uh, Constantine uh, made it the state religion under the Catholic Church, uh, they had adopted the uh, Alexandrian method of interpreting scripture, which was allegorical. Uh, and allegorizing scripture, uh, we say it dethrones God and enthrones the interpreter, because no longer is the authority of the words of scripture uh, in the mind of God, but the authority is on the interpreter, um, that it's up to him to decide what the meaning of scripture is. Uh, and what the reformers rescued for us during the Reformation was the literal hermeneutic. Uh, they focused primarily on soteriology. What exactly does it mean to be saved? And how exactly do we achieve that? Uh, so their primary focus was in rescuing this very essential doctrine of salvation from the Catholic Church, which had greatly corrupted it, um, even making people pay alms for it. Um, so paying money for your salvation. So the, the reformers really had a lot of work on their hands, and uh, it would be unreasonable to expect them to rescue every single doctrine that had been allegorized. And I believe this is one of those doctrines. Uh, eschatology is not a salvation issue. Uh, it's rational, reasonable, and thank God that he brought about the reformers to rescue the doctrine of salvation for us. Uh, but this, once the doctrine of salvation was well established, there's more time to be going into the rest of scripture and systematizing it, coming to a greater and deeper understanding of it. So that brings us to John Nelson Darby, who was by no means the first one to recognize the doctrine of the rapture and the doctrine of the millennium in scripture, but he was the first one to systematize it. Uh, but interestingly enough, he's not like many of the uh, the end times lovers that we have today, he was not studying prophecy. He was not looking for anything like the tribulation. His main focus, and in almost all of his writings, his main focus is the church. He did not come up with the pre-tribulational rapture uh, because he was looking for one. He came to it through an understanding of what it means to be the church as the body of Christ. So uh, this is by my professor, Jeremy Thomas. This is how he summarizes uh, John Nelson Darby's um, understanding. He says, what was not prevalent was a clear concept of the church as a distinct organism beginning on the day of Pentecost. This was the main contribution of John Nelson Darby, the man who is considered the father of dispensationalism. Darby began to realize the distinct organism of the church united with Christ, and from this began to see the pre-tribulational rapture. So the idea of the pre-tribulational rapture did not come through studying a lot of hard to understand eschatological passages. It came from a deep understanding of what it means to be the church as the body of Christ. So what happens at the Lord's return? Uh, here we get another sequence of events given to us by Paul. Uh, and this is just prior to where he tells them they have no need to be informed about all this because they know. Um, I think what he realized he was doing here was he's preaching to the choir. So this is stuff that the, first th or the, the Thessalonian church would have been well aware of. So what happens when the Lord returns? Uh, Paul says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not be so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Uh, so this 
is speaking of the return of the Lord and the resurrection of the dead in Christ, but he's giving it to them in the context of their own promise of resurrection. Now, all of these men to whom he was speaking are now part of that sleep in Christ group. Uh, we are those who have taken up the mantle and now are the ones alive in Christ. Uh, so this, this could be transferred directly to us. Uh, this audience has the same promise that we have of resurrection or of rapture. Uh, so if we are to fall asleep uh, while or before the Lord returns, we join this uh, this group of those asleep in Christ who will be resurrected prior to the rapture of the church. Uh, I do not believe this rapture of the church takes place long after the, uh, the resurrection of the dead. And I'll show you why, uh, because he, Paul continues and says, for the Lord himself will descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, be, therefore comfort one another with these words. And again, almost every time he speaks of the resurrection, speaks of the rapture, he says, comfort one another with these words. Comfort does not come through uh, going through tribulation and the recognition that it's just going to get a lot worse and worse and worse. Uh, Though the world itself does seem to be getting worse, and there's good evidence of that even in scripture, we will escape the worst of it, and that is our comfort, that Christ will uh, rescue us, just as he rescued Noah from the flood, uh, so he'll rescue us uh, from the tribulation that he's about to send, and that's, that's why last week we went through uh, and looked at the flood of Noah. Uh, because not only is it the base, the uh, Noahic covenant is the basis upon which God judges the earth uh, during the tribulation, but also it shows the principle of salvation and judgment, uh, kind of being the two hands that God holds equally, uh, that while he's giving judgment in the other hand, he's holding out salvation uh, to those who have put their faith in him. And that's what Noah did. He put his faith in God, and God saved him out of that judgment. So in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 50 to 52, Paul continues, uh, but this is not to the Thessalonians. Now, this is to the Corinthian church. And uh, this is a church that he had a lot of doctrine that he needed to correct within their church. Um, and this is coming towards the end of his first letter, where he's been rather scathing towards them. So he says, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperishable inherit the imperishable nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trump, trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Uh, so we call this, we've got two, again, theological words for this. We call the resurrection and the translation. So those who are asleep in Christ, their bodies will be resurrected, but no longer in a perishable body, but in an imperishable, imperishable body. Uh, they do not uh, have part in the second death. Uh, they are now alive to Christ. Well, the same happens for us, that uh, we are not destined for death if the Lord comes uh, before we die. Uh, we won't even taste the first death. Uh, rather, we'll be translated into our resurrection bodies. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 53 to 55, Paul continues. He says, for this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Uh, I love this because this is really the antagonist of the entire thrust of scripture has been death. And uh, we saw earlier in the writings of Paul that death is the last enemy that Christ will put under his feet. And he'll put that under his feet at the end of the millennial kingdom. Uh, 
So we see that uh, death will have no victory over us, and uh, it'll have no victory over us because Christ has been victorious over it. Uh, all right, so with this knowledge in mind, Paul had an exhortation for the church at Corinth. He said, basically, because we are anticipating this translation or because we are anticipating this resurrection, uh, we ought to be living as the Lord Jesus Christ has told us. So it says, for the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Uh, Martin Luther had a saying that he liked to say. He said he has only two dates written on his calendar, today and the day. Uh, and I think that's, that's what Paul is really exhorting the Christians to live like, uh, that the return of the Lord could happen at any time. And we ought to be about his business in the interceding time. And we can look back 2,000 years to the uh, first century church and see that the commandments for them were the same as they are for today. And uh, they were so anticipating the return of Christ that some of them even sold all that they had and were waiting for him in Jerusalem. Uh, I think having that heart and that mind about the return of Christ, it gives us hope. It gives us um, a reason to be about his business busily. Um, so we have to hold on to that hope because it should spur us on towards good works. And in 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 9, 2, 5, 5 through 9, um, he writes his second letter to the Corinthians. This one I think is not quite as blistering as the first, uh, but he is speaking to them again of hope and that we are awaiting the resurrection. So he says, now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God who gave to us the spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Uh, so Paul, um, at this point, and it continuously throughout uh, the end of his uh, ministry, uh, you, you see this growing angst to be at home with the Lord. Um, he says he's perfectly willing to be about the Lord's business here on earth, but he would so much rather be home. And uh, that gives us hope as well. Um, granted, in America, our tribulations at this point are not that bad. Uh, we've got it a lot easier than the Uyghurs in China or the the Filipinos, or there are just so many cultures around the earth that um, really do know what tribulation is and how hard it is to be a Christian uh, in this day and age. Uh, that doesn't mean that tribulation will escape us for long, uh, but we have had uh, a blessing of time here in America in the last few uh, centuries. And uh, as things start to get harder, if they get harder, um, and even if they remain relatively easy. Uh, we can hold on to this hope and this promise that uh, our tribulations on this earth are temporary, and that to be absent from our bodies is to be present with the Lord. Uh, and I think this is what gave many throughout history the strength to become martyrs for the Lord, was knowing that uh, the affliction would be brief, and their eternity would be um, more glorious than anything they could ever have on this earth. 